Hey folks, happy botanizing. Uh, eucalyptus lecture number three. I'm just going to keep rolling here. We're still focusing on common eucalypts of Hawkesbury Sandstone in Sydney. And I'm trying to make this a short, punchy one. I've only got three species before I think I'll make a separate video for the stringy barks. But um, let's go fewer. Th uh, through a few sorry it's been a long day let's go through a few uh other ones that we find on the hawksbury sandstone sort of getting into the mahoganies um this is eucalyptus resinifera uh, a common one in the sydney area uh and we'll hang out with those other uh usual suspects on the hawksbury sandstone it can be a big tree in its entirety 45 meters tall and it's got a mostly coastal distribution, uh, north from Jarvis Bay, down the south coast of New South Wales. Uh, it goes out to Wallamai National Park, northwest of Sydney, and it goes with a patchy occurrence right up to Cairns in Queensland um, and gets onto the northern tablelands of New South Wales. So mainly it's coastal, but it just makes some little inroads into the inland areas. Um, leaves to 16 uh, centimetres long, not millimetres, centimetres long, sorry, by, yeah, about four centimetres wide. Uh, dark green and discolorous. And one thing I'll show you is this uh, tight parallel or transverse uh, venation. That's a real thing to look for with uh, red mahogany or eucalyptus resinifera. When you first see them, you'll think they're a stringy bark. And you got to think, well, how do I know they're not a stringy bark? And we haven't covered the stringy bark yet. But what I'll say about the mahoganies is they've got a very generous, heavy sort of canopy. They create a lot of shade. This is, I would say, a remnant street tree or two trees uh, just across the road from my driveway. So I've got a part of the Georges River across the road, some really weedy mangrove vegetation. Uh, I'm in a modified Hawkesbury sandstone gully and then you've just got some remnant street trees around and I'd say these would be remnant. There's a lot of resinifera around my neighborhood and streets and uh, this is uh, resinifera. I, I park my car under it frequently. Um, we'll get to the stringy barks but the stringy barks tend to not have so much of a generous canopy. It's sort of a more contained I think not a very spreading umbrella-like canopy and most of them have concolorous leaves. This guy has discolorous leaves, strongly discolorous. And the thing that the stringy barks have is an uneven leaf base and we're going to look at that when we get onto the stringy barks. But these guys don't have that uneven, uneven leaf base that the stringy barks have. They've got a nice even leaf base, longer leaves generally, they're discolorous and a different sort of a nation. They've got different juvenile leaves as well to the stringy bark. So they do have a stringy bark like, you know, bark, <laughs> chunk. It looks slightly more platy compared to stringy barks. And when you pull it off, you, you can get some stringy bark like um, fibres, but um, they're, they're, it, it tends to be a little bit more platy and a bit more coarse and a bit more sort of uneven compared to a stringy bark. But I will forgive you for thinking they're stringy barks if you're getting familiar with them. Just look for a nice broad round canopy. Um, try and get hold of some leaves. If they're immediately discolorous, really strongly discolorous, or, you know, even mildly discolorous, you've got to start to think, I haven't got a stringy bark, I've got something else. Um, and that's this guy. Uh, so just another shot of the chunk there. It, it does look very stringy. Um, Umbalastus, 7 to 15 flowered. The fruit has very strongly exerted valves. I've got a few typos in this one. And uh, strongly hemispherical. We'll have a look at that in a second. And I've just said it, it can be part of sandstone ridge top and upper slope uh, woodland forest. And over its range, it can be found in wetter forests too on different substrates. I tend to see it on the Hawkesbury sandstone, maybe a little bit of shale sandstone transition. Uh, I'm not familiar with it really, you know, up in the Cairns region or something like that. And it, it might get into wetter forests up there. But uh, normally, 
when you've got them in a habitat or on a bushwalk, you can start to pick them just by the look and the and then you find look for the buds and the fruits on the ground. That's what I'm getting off the tree. So it is a stringy bark like um, consistency. So you know, almost a stringy bark, but not quite. I haven't managed to get my own photos, but this one here is uh, from Alan Fairley um, from our Australian Plant Society web uh, profile. And um, you can see these really prominent uh, calyptra or calyptrae on the buds. So they've got this really pointed, acute um, uh, calyptra, I guess, a bit like Eucalyptus pilularis. It's nice and pointy. And this tip on the calypteras can really attenuate out. It's like, you know, attenuate and, and nice and pointy on there. Some people will refer to that as a nipple or, or sort of a rostrum. It's it's like a pointy appendage on the end. And so the buds are, are nice and genuine, nice and big. Um, remember, I think I said pilularis, the leaves tend to be sort of uh, concolorous. And uh, they normally won't be as fat as the leaves of uh, resinifera. They'll be a bit um, narrower. So, again, the mahoganies provide this sort of genuine, generous canopy. They're, you know, it's sort of the tree you want to get under on a hot, hot day or maybe if it's bucketing down rain and you've got nothing else to get under. A mahogany will give you a bit more cover than a lot of other eucalypts. Um, just showing you that, and this is this is a really cool shot, um, and I forget where this has come from. I'm sorry to say I can't remember if this is mine or, or someone else's. There's there's a bud here that hasn't sort of developed. It hasn't gone uh, on to become a flower and then a fruit, and then you've got a fruit attached on the other side. So we've sort of got this petrified uh, flower bud. And uh, we've got a nice mature fruit on the other side. It's, it's a really weird image and, and quite confusing, but who knows what's happened there. But um, that's what we call a nice hemispherical fruit. It's meant to be sort of half of uh, planet Earth, you know, or half of a planet. It's a hemisphere. So it's nice and round, sort of bowl shaped. And then we've got these beautiful, strongly exerted valves. This is a great example of a capsule or gum nut, if you like, with really exerted valves. Very different to a lot of the other eucalypts um, we've seen so far. Um, you can see there's four valves there. I haven't really gone into the importance of the number of valves on any particular species on the fruit. A lot of the time, a species will be described as having three to four, four to five. I haven't really gone into that, but um, a lot of the time I don't find it very useful. Uh, but some eucalypts, you got to look out for the number of valves on the fruit uh, to, to give you a bit of direction on the species. Or sometimes to nail the species down. But I don't really care how many there are there. They're just really strongly, beautifully exerted. I always look for these underneath Eucalyptus resinifera. I always look for these. Try and find them as soon as I start seeing that. It can't be a stringy bark. The stringy bark fruit, as we'll see, they're just different. They're very different to that in in most cases. So um, this sort of is telling us that, hey, I don't think we've got a stringy bark species here. I threw this one in again. I don't want to be confusing, but this was that beautiful patch of Angophrocos starter, which was on Sydney Harbour, somewhere in um, Wollstonecraft or Warunga or... Wallara or one of those suburbs, I forget now. Um, and uh, I just photographed it because it's this amazing stand of Van Gogh starter, really typically Sydney. But in between these trees, I remember, there was Eucalyptus resinifera. There was there was a lot of resinifera, and um, I think there was Piperita and Pilularis as well. Hawkesbury Sandstone, right in the middle of Sydney. Um, but as you walk through here, you did get uh, resinifera. Uh, quite commonly. So it'll happily hang out with these guys, uh, Piperita, Pilularis, Sangophricos Stata, maybe Carimbia gumifera, and it does the same at my place. It, it's exactly the same in Sutherland Shire. So it's a tree you, you sort of need to look out for. Uh, just got, I just got these today, actually, to make the video. Um, just the strongly discolorous leaves. Now, a stringy bark 
pretty much will not have that degree of discoloration. They're normally concolorous. The juvenile leaves can be strongly discolorous, but the juvenile leaves aren't going to look like that. They're going to be very different. Possibly there's a stringy bark or two with slightly discolorous leaves, but this is strongly discolorous. That is very different one side to the other. Look, this, this has an oblique leaf base, a bit like a stringy bark, but once you start checking multiple leaves, remember to check representative samples. Check again and again and again. Don't just check one leaf and go, oh, that looks like a stringy bark leaf. Check them again and again and again and again and again and see what the overriding condition is. And if you go like that there, it's got a pretty even leaf base uh, on most of these leaves. You can just, you know, you get a lot of random variation. You can get things like that. That's like what I'm going to show with the stringy barks. That's what they're doing. But, you know, you can get that in some eucalypts, but normally that'll be the minority and this will be the majority sort of case. I just took another photo further up the path. I'm, I'm probably just showing off my garden really and not really focusing on these, but just another shot. Um, now I took this uh, on the iPhone uh, today. So as far as I understand, there's a subgenus of eucalyptus uh, known as Transversaria. It's a beautiful name. Uh, sounds like a magical fairyland. Uh, Transversaria, and what they're referring to is a group of eucalypts which have these very prominent, widely angled off the midrib, these widely angled veins, which are sort of parallel, tightly packed together, going like that. If you go back to the eucalyptus seabori I was showing, that sort of had really prominent veins going up this way sort of thing, sort of going like that. Well, on eucalyptus resinifera, and this is the other thing I look for, just those really prominent Almost looks like, I mean, this almost looks like something like Angophora floribunda, the underside of Angophora floribunda. It, it really does look like that, this really fine reticulate pattern. But you've got these constant veins going out like this, and that is typical eucalyptus resinifera, and that's what they mean by transversaria. This is the top side of the leaf, just taken in a bit of fuzzy light tried to get the iPhone on it. And again, you can see these widely angled veins. It's just a mirror of the bottom side going out like that. Hopefully you can see them there. I tried to get a good macro shot. That's typical resinifera. So combine the discoloration, the nice sort of generous canopy, maybe a, a bit more of a rounded balanced tree. I find stringy barks often tend to have a bit of an uneven canopy. Um, maybe Globoidea, they're a bit symmetrical, but they've got very short leaves uh, most of the time, not very long leaves like Resinifera. And look for those fruits, look for those buds and get some leaves and look for these really tight transverse uh, veins. Uh, that's, what, that's what they mean by transversaria. I don't know what other eucalypts are in that group, but like I said, I don't get into these um, subgenera uh, very much. Um, I've left that reference there for Euclid, but these are my photos. I just took these today, but that's okay. So just back to the tree, that's an overall shot. Nice rounded canopy, this one. It's sort of got a nice balanced canopy. There's another tree right behind me, um, and they've been there for a long time. And, um, you know, I'll say it, people hate trees, but uh, on a hot summer's day, everyone's uh, competing with me to park their car underneath this one. So... There you go. Um, that's the range. Uh, you can see it's mainly coastal down here to what was it? Jarvis Bay and then Apache distribution to, well, Cairns is about there, I think. So it's going up further to Cooktown, Cape York Peninsula. Um, just remember again, that, that dot's in Canberra. That would be a herbarium, uh, sorry, a botanic gardens tree probably. And those ones in Melbourne would be probably planted trees. So that's the core distribution. Looks like it's been planted in New Zealand. Um, I don't know if it's running a muck in New Zealand or not. Uh, you know, gone weedy, I'm not sure. So that's Eucharesinifera. Um, not too hard to figure out if you can get some fruit, get some buds. 
We move on to eucalyptus botryoides, a very common one in Sydney and further afield, very coastal. It's not really a sandstone species, it's more of a sand deposit species, I would say. So maybe where sand dunes are overlying the Hawkesbury sandstone, where younger Aeolian sand deposits are, are, are sort of overlying the sandstone. Uh, I'm talking areas like Kernel, uh, Kamei Botany Bay National Park. You got to think when um, Cook and Banks and Co came in in 1770, Botryoides was probably the first eucalypt they saw. It, it probably was uh, really, uh, unless it was Angophrocos starter or something like that. But you, you got to think Botryoides would have been one of the first eucalypts they looked at. There's a ton of them there at Kernel. They like the swamp sclerophyll forest on coastal floodplains at EEC. Uh, you, yeah, I, I, I can't really think of them growing on sandstone outcrop, but they're, they're definitely on a sand dune and normally near water um, and the beach and, and those sort of areas. Uh, called the Bangalay or Bang Alley uh, sometimes. I'm not sure what the, the derivation of that is. Um, you can see Bangalay or you can see Bang Alley sometimes, which uh, sounds a bit um, like something humans get up to at midnight, but um, <laughs> I'm not too sure. Bastard mahogany, that always normally meant that the timber was inferior to the mahogany, uh, so uh, it would get called the bastard mahogany. Uh, with a strong coastal distribution between Victorian border and Newcastle, extends to near Trialgan in Victoria along the coast and coastal interior. So it doesn't really get too far inland. Found on sand deposits and alluvial flats. Um, it's got a bark of coarsely fibrous, tessellated, with white to grey smooth chunks above, so or, or limbs above. So uh, Botryoides is another one of these which uh, has a good solid bit of uh, tessellated bark at the bottom and then it has smooth limbs up the top. So again like Pilularis, again like Piperita, um, it's a part bark but um, once you get familiar with it uh, and it, they've got a sort of look to them, Botryoides, it's, and, and normally combined with a habitat it doesn't make identification too difficult. Uh, these are the start of what the fruits are going to do. They they start to look like this. They're sort of these, I call them these sort of, um, they're like cups. They're like a sort of, uh, I don't know, like maybe a child's cup, like a plastic cup. they are um, got that sort of look to them, a bit barrel shaped. And the leaves, again, are strongly discolorous. Uh, you can see it there. And you can sort of see it in this photo here too, although these leaves are a bit faded. I think this branch was lying on the ground, but... They're strongly discolorous. There's a great example there. So it's probably a mahogany feature, the ones I'm showing anyway. They're strongly discolorous. It doesn't really have a stringy bark. It's got more of a coarsely tessellated bark. And you can sort of pull off uh, chunks of it sort of thing. Um, here's the buds. The umbalasters are 7 to 11 flowered. And I've just said buds with distinctive appearance. This is a Euclid photo that I've borrowed. It was showing it a bit better than the ones I got uh, earlier. But just start with, there's a really short operculum. There's a much longer hypantheum. So they're very different to Resinifera here. They've got a very short operculum, much longer hypantheum. And you can see them probably kicking on into the more, uh, you know, maybe just a bit variable over here. It has been said to me by others, and I've remembered this for about 20 years uh, from learning these trees in horticulture. Um, TAFE is where I first learnt, first learnt most of them. People have said that the buds resemble a particular human organ. And I'll leave you with that. You can uh, use your imagination, and I don't want to get any uh, more rude than that. <laughs> but that's what people have said to me. Um, and look, I've remembered that. I've remembered that um, over 20 years. So whatever helps you identify these things is whatever helps you identify them. If you want to remember that, uh, you remember that. I do. And when I see the buds, I always remember that um, anecdote in the TAFE class, which I remember the teacher had a really good laugh at. So that's the Botryoides buds. 
very different to Resinifera and very different to Pilularis. Um, I didn't show the buds of Piperita, but they're very different as well. Um, it's really funny, Bocciotis, where you get it sometimes. This is out at Camden in, in nice, genuine western, southwestern Sydney, Campbelltown, Camden area. And we've got this um, endangered ecological community, which has pretty much been wiped out. Um, it's all gone under houses and there's about 10 hectares left. But this is the Eldersley Banksia scrub forest. And again, it's a, it's a younger sand deposit along the Nepean River. Um, at Eldersley, and there's a lot of, you know, genuine sand. You get Banksia integrifolia. You also get Angophora floribunda and Angophora subvelutina, and you get Eucalyptus botryoides. So it's a bit of a weird place for it to be hanging out, but it, but it hangs out on these sand deposits around, you know, Campbelltown. They reckon, I think, there's a bit more at Menangle and, and Picton perhaps too. Uh, it's very, I find it's very similar to Walkworth Sands Woodlands, if you know that really famous EEC that um, went under or, or got removed for all the, a lot of the coal mines up there in the Hunter Valley. It's very similar floristically. That doesn't have eucalyptus botryoides, but it's got Angophora floribunda and Banksia integrifolia again, and you get a nice bracken and pymelia and ground layer. It's a bit weedy, but these are nice big botryoides. Uh, and I said it's also common in the swamp sclerophyll, coastal floodplain EEC. A lot of beaches, a lot of uh, rivers enter in the ocean nearby, like Kernel. Um, you will get, uh, if you can get a lot of swamp sclerophyll forest, you'll get a lot of uh, eucalyptus botryoides. It's a real, uh, uh, you know, you've probably been to a lot of campsites in New South Wales close to the ocean or close to, you know, a water, a water body and um, where I've set up my tent in areas in, in national park campsites close to the beach, not you know, 90% of the time I'm setting my tent up underneath the eucalyptus botryoides. That's, that's a tree of, you know, real beachside campsites, you know, in New South Wales. That's a tree that sort of is really common through a heap of, a heap of national park campsites um, going up and down the coast. Um, that's just where Botryoides hangs out, right right near the ocean. Um, that's just a photo of the upper limbs. Um, yeah, they, they just go bare. They go bare like this. They're a bit of a greeny white, I suppose. What this sort of bark peeling off here, it, it sort of reminds me of that tree we know, brush box, uh, Lophostemon confertus. It, it reminds me of that a bit, this sort of uh, flaky bark here. Um, the leaves, you know, they're not overly long a lot of the time. They tend to be a little bit shorter and fatter than, say, Resinifera. But, you know, you just look for these upper smooth limbs. Uh, you're looking for those fruit that I showed um, and just those buds. And it's a pretty distinctive uh, tree. I took another photo of an overall tree, but I haven't got it in here. But... Um, yeah, sorry about that. I meant to put another photo in. But just uh, get familiar with it. Check out those barrel-shaped fruits. Look at some images online. Uh, look at the, the, the buds, which, uh, like I said, uh, have that appearance. And uh, just look for these, these upper smooth limbs. I've just got another tip for Botryoides, I find, and I didn't get a photo of it today. But... I showed this at one of the workshops and I, I was able to, to, to prove it pretty well. If you get hold of a handful of leaves of Botryoides, a lot of the time there's these distinctive dead brown bits on the leaves. They're, they're like these little square sort of localised dead parts on the leaves. I have always found that very consistent and very useful. So just look for these uh, dead brown parts uh, sort of squarish a lot of the time. Sometimes they're joining the mid vein. I don't have a clue what it is. It's just these localised dead parts of um, leaf tissue. And I find it commonly on botryoides. So just look for that as well. It's uh, whatever helps you sort of get your eye in. Uh, last one for this uh, video. This is Eucalyptus robusta, the swamp mahogany. This isn't a tree I come across very often. 
it's again a very strongly coastal tree it will grow with botryoides in sort of very boggy uh, moist areas close to the coast it likes sort of to get its feet wet and it, it's just not a tree i get often on surveys you can find the plants the odd planted one here and there but it's a good one to know anyway because it's very easily identifiable it has a strong brown full length bark not a not a part bark like botryoides and it's very strongly tessellated, which means it's in sort of, a, you know, a, a jigsaw of sort of roughly polygonal rectangular pieces. That's, that's what we're calling sort of uh, tessellated, like a tessellated pavement. Uh, grows in coastal swampy areas on sand deposits from around Naruma to north of Rockhampton, Capricorn coastline, usually within 50 kilometres of the coast. So it doesn't get too far inland. Uh, these are some remnant ones down the road from me. They do grow next to some swamp oak floodplain forest on another little part of the Georges River, Botany Bay. So they're probably remnant. They're nice big uh, trees now. A lot of weed invasion. Uh, look, they've just got a very generous canopy. Uh, the leaves can be very wide, four and a half centimetres or maybe five for Eucalyptus robusta. 17 centimetres long, strongly discolorous, much paler underneath. So again, they're just a mahogany with a very generous fat canopy. So I'm sort of saying the leaves will be much fatter than a typical stringy bark. And again, you don't have those uh, repeating oblique leaf bases. Umbalasters, seven to 15 flowered. Look for flattened peduncle. That's pretty uh, conspicuous. Though I might have said that about some of the other species, but at least look for it with this one. Largely cylindrical fruit. They can be to 18 millimetres long. These cylindrical, um, almost like, uh, sort of almost like a champagne glass sort of thing. Um, but they've got a particular look to them. Valves are rim level or, ex uh, I should say, or, or exerted. Uh, here's a photo again. I haven't done this one justice, but here's a good one here from Alan. They've got these really conspicuous buds with this really elongated beak on the uh, calyptra or the calyptrae. So uh, look for that. They do refer to that as being rostrate. That's a, uh, that's a calyptra that is rostrate where it's got a very pronounced beak or what we might call a nipple or a rostrum, I guess, on that end of that operculum. And the whole thing is about one to one. So if you measure the operculum or the calyptra to the hypantheum, about a one to one ratio. So that's very typical eucalyptus robusta. And then just lucky enough, he got, Alan got the fruit as well. So there's the buds. We got some nice ripe flowers and there's the fruit. And you can see they're, they're like sort of, uh, what would you call them? some sort of champagne glass or some sort of uh, barrel, uh, tall sort of uh, urn-like almost. They're just this, you know, really long 15 to 20 mil, possibly a centimetre across. So they're nice and big, robust. Uh, it's, it's a good name for the whole tree, every part of the tree. They got a really dense canopy, fat leaves, big buds and big fruits. So again, they're hard to mistake for any other tree if you're finding all this. Um, you know, they're, they're quite a genuine article, Robusta. Uh, what do we got? Just some more buds there. This is good. You got the operculum starting to get squeezed off. So just look at how it's a great example of how that calyptra just gets pushed off the bud. They are going to fall to the ground. They just fall to the ground. They just litter the ground. When the tree's in full flower, you'll see a ton of these on the ground. This one's opened. There's the one female part in the middle. All those stamens. I'd hate to have to count them all. And these guys are going to follow suit in this sort of sequence. So it's a great photo, that, by Murray Fagg. It's really good. Nice fat leaves in Robusta. And I'm really sorry that I haven't got a photo of the discoloration. It's really strong, really, really, really strong. So the underside is much paler than the top side. 
So just look for that. And you've got a nice even leaf base. You know, you might say that one's a little bit uneven, but do representative sa uh, repetitive sampling. And you should see they've got pretty even bases. They've got nice red stems too here. Uh, so like I said with Seabari, there's, there's a few eucalypts that can have nice red stems. Just another photo of the fruit. This is on PlantNet, Andrew Orm. You can really see those elongated, uh, there's the, you know, have a look at what the valves are doing in there. I, I thought the valves might have been enclosed or uh, rim level, but they, they say they're exerted or rim level. So maybe they get slightly exerted, but they look to me here like they're well and surely inside the fruit. But look out for those anyway. The shape is what you want. And normally you can find them on the ground in pretty good, pretty good numbers. So that's Eucalyptus Robusta. There's the range. Doesn't go as far as, uh, what was it, Botryoides? It stops there around the Rockhampton uh, Peninsula area. But you can see how coastal it is. It's got a real coastal distribution robusta. So if you find any trees out this way, they're, they're going to be planted, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's a nice tree robusta. Genuine article. Now, I'm going to leave that there because in the next video, we're going to jump into stringy barks, and I think that needs its own sort of uh, focus. So I'll leave it there for now. The next video I put up once I construct it, a notoriously difficult group. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. So we'll have a look at those and try and uh, get to grips with some um, familiar ones. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.